Okay, welcome back everybody to the Magnusry Street podcast, uh, along with my brothers Sari and Osama, who are, I think it's very early there, so good morning, guys. Good morning. Hello. Today we're going to talk about, we have um, a discussion that's going to be very, very dear to my heart and to all our hearts here in this, uh, in this podcast episode, and that is to do with football, and specifically trying to think about the intersections between football and, uh, and politics in the shadow of, of course, in the shadow of the Gaza genocide, and, um, and perhaps maybe what can be done. So, you know, what, what can we do? And in particular, um, it's, it, we, we thought it'd be very, very interesting to talk uh, in relation as well to the South African example and the South African model of, uh, of boycott and what was done in the earlier period and see if there's something to be learned about that kind of mobilization and this kind of uh, issues to do with, with what we can think about in terms of Palestine today. So we're very, very, very happy to have not one, but actually two guests today joining us, both of whom are South African, uh, Tony Karen and Sean Jacobs. And they're both, as I said, South African, but both also working and living now in, in New York. So Tony Karen is the editorial lead of the Al Jazeera Plus in, in the U.S., um, he's spent, you know, he's worked in various places, including at Time magazine, and very importantly, spent the 1980s working as an activist for the ANC and the kind of larger, broader anti-apartheid liberation movement in South Africa. Uh, he's, uh, he's also an adjunct professor at the New School in New York and uh, teaching with, uh, with uh, our other guest, Sean Jacobs, a course which I, I wish I could take or partake in, which is the politics of global soccer. Um, he reminds me to say that he's also a very avid and faithful Liverpool fan. We'll get into that at the end since we are, the rest of us, Mac, this is our Arsenal fans. And so hopefully we won't get into a big argument about this. Uh, our other guest is uh, Sean Jacobs, and he's an associate professor of international affairs at the graduate program in, uh, in international affairs at the New School as well. Uh, he publishes the very kind of, the, the very good and very influential Africa is a country website. I think it's a website, but kind of uh, maybe, Sean, you can talk about it a little bit later, uh, which is it's a site of criticism, analysis, and new writing with a focus, I think, on Africa. He's, uh, he published a, a book, The Media in Post-Apartheid South Africa, Post-Colonial Politics in the Age of Globalization in 2019. Uh, he was also born in Cape Town um, and had worked there at the Institute for Democracy in South Africa and was you know, previously a journalist as well. So we're really, really happy to have you guys uh, join us for this, you know, uh, this, this really fun but also important topic uh, on the intersection of football and politics. So without further ado, what I would love for you guys to do is to kind of to introduce yourselves a little bit more on how you came to football and this kind of intersection of football and politics, um, and we can go from there. So maybe, Tony, you want to start? <coughs> So the, if the question is, how did I become a red, um, as in the, <laughs> the, of the Anfield um, variety? Um, you know, I think growing up in, in South Africa, it's a settler colonial society <clears throat> that takes its, um, it, it, its identity in some ways is, is located uh, in, in the West. And, you know, particularly English speaking South Africans, it was like, uh, you know, the culture of the UK is somehow your culture, like the comic books, you're reading Tiger and Jag and eventually you're reading Shoot magazine. And so everybody in, you know, my school or whatever, you adopt an English football team. Of course, there's no television at that time. Um, most of my peers had been Leeds supporters because that's who was kind of winning in the early 70s. I sort of like, I liked Kevin Keegan. I liked John Toshak. I was like, okay, Liverpool were on about 1974. Um, you know, I adopt them as my team because you adopt a team. Uh, you become sort of obsessive just from the football uh, perspective. Now, there's no television in South Africa in the, in the mid until like 1977, and there's no football on television for much later. Um, we get uh, there was a brothel owner in Cape Town in something called the White House Hotel. Uh, <laughs> this guy was entrepreneurial and clever, and he had a VHS tape flown in uh, every Sunday night. Um, of that week's match of the day and big match. So we could go and pay like the equivalent of a dollar or two and go and sit, you know, these schoolboys sitting in this, uh, in, in this lounge in a brothel uh, watching our, our teams. Um, and, but yes, then, you know, later you, you sort of, you, it was, Liverpool was a great option in a way because uh, it turns out, you know, as you sort of mature into 
politics, you leave high school, you become, you know, much more politically aware, politically active. And then the core values of Liverpool, that you'll never walk alone, the solidarity, Bill Shankly saying, I'm a socialist that believe, you know, everybody working together for the greater good, etc. It's like these values are, are, are sort of very present there. So, um, yeah, I mean, football, Liverpool, you know, yeah, and it's not always a perfect fit. Let's be clear, like Liverpool has some blemishes. In its, in its history and so on. But the other thing is even, you know, as an activist in, in the 80s, you start to see uh, the power of football as a form of civil society, particularly a stadium. Stadiums are completely ungovernable. Like at the height of the, the second state of emergency in 1988, we can't operate openly. We're all living in hiding. There's no open political work happening. And it's the main state cup final on television. And suddenly you see somebody like on the flagpole in the stadium, they've raised the ANC flag, which is illegal. It's a seven year jail sentence just for that. And the head of the FA makes a speech that could have been written by, by from Lusaka, basically. It could have been written by the ANC. And you realize like the cops can't come into a stadium. Like stadiums are kind of uh, a, a liberated space or can be. So yes, you start to see a lot of potentials there. Some of that we can discuss later. Throwing to Sean. I mean, okay, so thanks for having us. So thanks, Tony, that a lot of what Tony says is slightly, slightly the same and slightly different. So I'm just slightly young, younger than Tony. So by the time I sort of figure out my, I, I'm also a Liverpool fan, of course, no surprises. Um, but for me, it happened. So two things, just kind of football as a red. And, and I think Liverpool is sort of a working class club. It's associated with generally with the left, as Tony said, it has blemishes, like big blemishes actually around race. Um, in the early 1980s, Howard Gale, who played for Liverpool, barely got, I think he played five games in five years. And then later, John Barnes, I, I, he was actually abused by his own fans. So Liverpool, not great, working class cl club, Irish immigrant club. So I, I suppose I, and later I met actually lots of Liverpool fans who came to South Africa to work with do research on trade unions and work with local trade unions. And that cemented my relationship with Liverpool. But essentially just on, on that, by the time I sort of figure out uh, my relationship with football, there is television and they're showing like a one, it's like called match of the day. So once a week they show, like, show a game, it's usually the FA Cup. And then they start showing the European Cup finals, the European competitions. And of course, Liverpool is winning. My dad, of course, was a Liverpool fan. But just because Liverpool was winning, I suppose, I kind of got into Liverpool. But specifically to, as somebody who grew up in South Africa with local South African football, by the time I, by the 1980s, the dominant, the, the dominant sports organization in the townships where I grew up was the South African Council on Sports, or SACOS. They were formed after 1973, and they had an explicit politics um, they lived by the slogan called No Normal Sport in an Abnormal Society. And they they were, at that point, they were the leaders of the sports boycott. So, so by the time I kind of get my my sort of political imagination right by the early 1980s, when I was like 14, 13 years old, SACOS is, is, that's how I do school sport. And to Tony's point, stadiums, before the annual sports event between the different schools, SACOS officials would address the crowd or, and, and because SACOS at that point was an organization that included both members of the ANC, so what was known as the unity movement, so these are like Trotskyites, the ANC are kind of, <laughs> these differences are ridiculous, but the ANC was known as the Congress Alliance, they sort of allied to the Communist Party, but these, all these people would be in the stadium and they would talk about apartheid, about the need for liberation, about the need to not play uh, uh, this unequal sport, because officially sanctioned sport was basically white sport and what and we can go into maybe later about how this is complicated as tony says israel is also a settler colonial society like south africa and so how those things get complicated when you do sports activism so there's official white sport which in some spaces are still affiliated to these international organizations so by the end the beginning of the 1980s FIFA had already banned South Africa. The IOC had banned South Africa from the Olympics. But there's some sports like rugby and cricket. They're still having tours to South Africa. Sometimes, despite protests, they're still coming. And so the campaigns that you try to have in South Africa, as I was in high school at the time, had to be very smart about how to approach 
those particular, how, how do you react to these tours for which the South African government is, has invited cricketers from England, Sri Lanka, the West Indies, uh, rugby players from like England, Ireland, New Zealand. How do you react to that to stop those tours? So I grew up in that kind of environment. Later on, of course, uh, as I got older, I saw how sport could also play a role within society as around nation building. So like if and when you have to construct another country, sport in South Africa in particular became this vehicle, very complicated again, uh, sometimes to the good, sometimes to the bad, but it did become this vehicle to which people could imagine like another country. And, and in some cases, it's only now, for example, when you think of rugby, where South Africans can have like a proper relationship with rugby as a national sport, but before it could be exploited for often very reactionary uh, liberal politics here. But yeah, that's sort of my, I can say a lot more. <laughs> that's generally my introduction to sport. Sean, sure, one thing I think I would, would add to what you just said, which might be relevant also in a Palestinian context, is the sports washing that starts from like the late 70s, where uh, some black players are being recruited into the white sports system to show that it's actually not, you know, to make it more uh, acceptable internationally. And so, I mean, that sort of challenge, which I guess for uh, 48ers in, in the Palestinian context must be also something of an issue. Yeah, I just uh, let me just follow up quickly, and then I want my brothers to, to come in here. But I just want to, since we're talking about the early things, I want to talk just briefly about how I came to football as well, which is, you know, and how we came to, to support Arsenal uh, at an early age, again, in the late 1970s. Um, and, and that had, in a sense, it had the Irish connection as well to it, and which, which for me was, was very important. So we were watching, and again, our neighbors, the, our, our neighbor, the father of our neighbor actually would smuggle in match of the day. And so we would be able to watch it in, in, in that format through these kind of video cassettes at the time. But meanwhile, we would listen to the BBC World Service on Saturday afternoon. It was a Saturday afternoon, 5 p.m. Uh, in Beirut time. We would sit there listening and they would always put the second half, the commentary in the second half. And so they had everything. It was the cricket and rugby and everything. And then they would always kind of come in and say, oh, we just heard there's a goal at Arsenal or a goal somewhere else. And they would kind of go through the score. So that's it, really... A, an incredible memory and, uh, you know, some of my favorite memories listening or watching football. Uh, and then with Arsenal, it, you know, they, I, because of the FA Cup, they, they sort of got to the final in 77 and 78, 79. Uh, and, um, and then I discovered that they had these Irish, they had a, a bunch of Irish players. And I didn't really know, but they had Republic and Northern at the time, but, you know, they're still Irish for me. Uh, so I came to support Ireland and Northern Ireland in the, in, in international, in the World Cup games. And 1982, when the Israelis invaded and they was kind of you know besieging Beirut, we had, we ended up having to watch those World Cup matches in nineteen in the summer of nineteen eighty two, on some of the car batteries. Everybody would hook up the car batteries. There was no electricity. They would hook up car batteries and get these little televisions, and we would be watching then. And I remember the famous kind of I think it was Northern Ireland it was the Republic I don't remember, Ireland that they won that match uh, against Spain. And that was kind of a big moment. The Republic of Ireland, right. And, and, and I missed it because I missed that goal because electricity cut and the car battery died and we had to hook it up. And I missed the goal exactly in those few minutes, unfortunately. I think it was a Spurs, I think it was a Spurs player who scored. But... My, my, oh, yeah, that's true, which is probably why I missed it. So I just w wanted to put this through. I'm sure my brothers will, will kind of will join in on that. Uh, guys, you want to say anything on this or shall we move on a little bit? And then we can get back to the kind of more personal rivalries here but um yeah i'll just say one other quick thing also about that that kind of growing up with football and politics so one other example was in i think 1988 and arsenal fans will hate this i think it was um uh, was it luton luton played uh played arsenal in the little woods cup just <laughs> that kind of memory and the stain brothers brian stain and mark stain they were they were from south africa their father had gone to South Africa in the early 1960s as a political exile. So they ended up growing up in England, playing football there. So this game com comes on, it's on television. And this is that the other part of the, the English Premier League, Tony says, well, for sort of white South Africa, there's like a cultural, there's this cultural thing with England. For me, it was more like living vicariously through those players because they're, they, I could, they, they're English at that point. But they still, at some level, representing black people, Cape Town, the city, and they're basically the the, the one brother, the, the the Brian Stain scores, I think, both the goals. Mark Stain, the younger brother, comes on and makes the assist. And so, when you watch it, South Africa is banned from football, so you're 
you're kind of seeing South Africa play. And then all these, uh, there's a lot of South African players, I think at that point who play in various leagues around Britain. So through them, you're sort of living the nation. And I, I mean, I'd be curious like how Palestinians then, apart from the national team that's playing in the Asian Cup, that's playing in various Asian competitions, there are players who are, you know, representing Palestine through the diaspora. And it, at some at some level, in maybe maybe before Palestine became like a, a team that is that now play, you know that, that is recognized, that is competitive, how people had those relationships might also be be interesting. But yeah, that's another memory. There's so many of those memories that I can now that I'm now recalling as I'm sitting here. Just to to throw in one thing there was that you know when, when Porto played Man United in the European Cup final, for Cape Town that was a derby because Benny McCarthy. And Quentin Fortune had been on opposite sides of teams in Cape Town for years and years. And by the way, everybody in Cape Town knew Porto would win that because they said basically no, uh, no Benny team has ever lost to a Quentin team. <laughs> Just <saying. laughs> okay, so that's that's great, and we're going to come back to this, you know. But I, may, maybe we can start, um, you know, it, I, I, you know, with with this kind of connection between South Africa and Palestine. Um, Sean, maybe I can just ask you because I, I was reading a piece that you wrote, uh, you know, I think it was in the New York Times, and you mentioned that in light of the ICJ case, which we've talked about quite a bit in, on this on this podcast in previous uh, episodes, the the ICJ genocide case you you mentioned where you took your your daughter to see a, a South African band in in New York uh, in a music festival in New York, and you say you know there was this resurgence of South African flags. Which, which I think you, you know, you, I think you were mentioning hadn't really, you know, been seen in a while. And then the, the word that kind of, the, or the phrase that stuck out in this, you say, on the eve of the hearing, a friend messaged me from Cape Town of the ICJ hearing. It feels a bit like Christmas Eve or something here, or the night before a big final, so presumably a football final or some cup final. So, can can you talk a little bit about this and this this renewed South African Palestine connection, which we have from our, let's say, from our child in a sense, and then you know. Not disappeared, but was sort of in in the in the background, and then has come back in full force these last uh, this last year. I mean, yeah, I mean the, the 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 what my friend was referencing was in in the city of Cape Town. There are all these. There were suddenly all these murals going up. Um, not this one district that everybody goes to in Cape Town to go take photos now called the Boer Cup. It's a holdover from slavery. There's a community that lives there. They're descendants of slaves. Uh, Muslim, so they painted the houses with like flags and watermelons. But then, just in any suburb, if you in any suburb in Cape Town, particularly in the townships, somebody will like paint the whole front of their house. Uh, they'll paint. Uh, their Tony's putting a photograph of him standing in front of a block of, of apartment block, where the whole apartment block is painted in the Palestinian flag. So this, the, which is sort of strange, if you New York City, where you know somebody's putting up a solitary flag. And some and 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 you're sort of awaiting this the the, the hearing and the Hague, and your friend is telling you like, yo, this is the atmosphere around here. It's a it's it's much different. It's everywhere. You can see flags. You can see houses. You you know flags from balconies, etc. But what I think he was getting at, and you were sort of alluding to it, is during the struggle against apartheid, there was a very clear clear link between the South African struggle. And the Palestinian struggle, and this was mainly articulated um, as, as decolonial struggles, so struggles for self-determination. And there was a very close relationship at various times between the PLO um, and the ANC. The when the when the when the ANC sort of finally gets into government, which is after the end of the the end of the the, the Cold War, uh, it's I think about a it's it's during that period when Oslo, the sort of the the beginnings of kind of negotiating, you know, however, we're, like the Oslo Accords will come from that. So that's like the context in which the ANC comes to power. Initially, with Nelson Mandela as president, the ANC is very bullish about its foreign policy and linking it to that era of the struggle and that history and that memory. And so Mandela is very explicit about the relationship between South Africans and Palestinians. And I don't have to repeat, you know, he makes a uh, speech about it. We are not free, and I'm paraphrasing. Until Palestinians are free, he visits Ramallah. So there's like a the, the, there's a there's a there's a very clear link between how the ANC initially and how South Africans initially think about that relationship. But what happens over time is that that relationship and that link to Palestine recedes from 
the political agenda of the South African government, from the public agenda of the ruling party, and just from the South African public sphere. Now, we could have many reasons for that, whether it's that South Africa now has to confront the, you know, sort of post-colonial world in which it is just another ordinary country from the third world, and it doesn't get this kind of play internationally anymore that it may have enjoyed when it was involved in the struggle against apartheid. Um, or it might be because the second president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, he focuses more on the rest of the African continent and, you know, he's facilitating the entry of South African capital. But politically, if you think foreign policy, he's trying to solve, for good or bad, some of the problems of, of the African continent around, uh, you know, political independence for certain countries that weren't independent yet, uh, violence, the holdovers from the Cold War, um, civil wars, etc. And then the last, the 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 president before the current president Zuma, he's uh, he's just interested in how he can how he can empty the state coffers. It's like corruption is on like you know it's on steroids. So it's paying attention to any foreign policy, that's not even happening at that point. Interestingly, there's more civil society attempts. So there's like a there's a. a a boat, I think, that went from, I think it was either Greek or Cyprus, that tried to get into Gaza uh, with a number of South Africans on board. Um, there's there's the beginnings, I think, of the BDS in South Africa. The BDS becomes a really important organization. It's the South African BDS. Um, there's these sort of regular protests by members of the local Muslim community that would turn out in large numbers, you know, like um, at various moments. If, one, if Israel, when they regularly would would attack um, Palestinians, you know, during the summer, Operation This, Operation That, then there's reaction protests in South Africa. I think what happened here is everybody was, and Tony, I, I don't know what Tony, how Tony interpreted this, but people were caught by surprise, kind of by the ICJ hearing. South Africa had not, the South African government had made these kind of noises, you know, like any, any country, even like countries in the Arab world, where you regularly condemn Israel. Uh, but you're still doing business with Israel. Uh, South Africa's, I think, is uh, South Africa's Israel's largest trading partner on the African continent. Um, South Africans uh, who still fight for the IDF, even though South Africa has laws that says you cannot fight for any foreign army, you cannot be a mercenary, you cannot fight for any an army of a foreign state. But there are South Africans who fight for Israel in the IDF. So South Africa was saying things but not doing much. It was like lip service or kind of uh, half, half, can I say half ass? <laughs> Halfway, you may have to blur that part. Um, you know, like not, there was no real commitment. But here's what I think, and I'll, I'll stop after this, is suddenly there were, there are organizations in South Africa, particularly lawyer organizations that have been very prominent during the, the 1980s, especially in representing communities that are on land or housing or evictions, you know, some particular issue. Those lawyers, after the end of apartheid, they had started to take on the South African government. Things like a group of um, mental health patients had died in a state hospital, so they sued the government. Um, people sued the government over their right to housing. So these various, uh, take, take the government on over the funding of political parties, etc. So those same set of lawyers took how they had been operating in South Africa to broaden South African democracy. And they are the ones who then teamed up with the South African government to take Israel to the, to the court at the ICJ. So that feeling, what I'm describing in that introduction, just sort of like this kind of pride in this idea of being South Africa, remembering that history between Palestinians and South Africa that had existed under apartheid and, and feeling and having felt over almost like two decades that that had dissipated, except for these occasional protests or uh, necessary making the necessary noises, but doing nothing. Suddenly there was something real happening from South Africa and it was smart. They had used a, an obscure court that's part of the UN system, which nobody had actually ever talked about before this. Most people talk about the ICC, but they knew that that is the court that Israel had to answer to, that Israel had to appear at that court, and they used that court to, uh, to make that happen. Yeah. So that was generally the energy, I think, that I was trying to capture at that point. <clears throat> Just a couple of short, short uh, additions there. I mean, I think uh, in the movement, in, in the sort of 70s and 80s, like 
the ANC had a third world identity, third world ist identity. We were the global liberation from colonialism and imperialism. So, and the Palestinians were almost first among equals in that system for us, because not only because of the regime's um, close ties, that the, literally Israel was South, the regime's closest ally. So that was, you know, baked in. Uh, literally in Cape Town, you can see Leila Khaled's face, like a Che Guevara face on a wall, graffiti, you know, a stencil with no, no caption. Everybody knows who that is, right? Like Che Guevara. So there's that very embedded sense in civil society that Palestine is us. And, you know, like that, there's that deep connection. I think <clears throat> following what Sean was saying, basically what happens in the 90s is NC comes to power. We know what, you know, <clears throat> South Africans know where, where we stand on these issues, but nobody says a thing because this is the end of the Cold War. This is the end of history. Um, referee Fukuyama has blown his whistle and, uh, you know, <laughs> that's it. Um, like everybody keeps very quiet. Everybody, nobody can act because when you sue Israel for genocide, you are effectively suing the United States for complicity in genocide. Like there's no way around that. You have to be willing to stand up to the U.S. and take the consequences. So I think that is the bigger um, re, you know, analytical uh, indicator of what's happening here. And you've seen it with Ukraine as well. Like South Africa has been willing to basically stand up and, and say no to, to the U.S. And we do not accept a binary world uh, system where we have to choose between uh, the United States and Russia, China, et cetera. So South Africa has relations with everyone and they've been willing to antagonize the Americans um, on that. And I think it's in what you're seeing there is this is sort of global South rising, that South Africa is taking a lead, but you can see Malaysia's hinting that way, Brazil's hinting that way. There's a sense of like, we can't actually afford a world order run by the US anymore. But even, even, but even then what South Africa has done smartly is one of the lawyers on the South African case is Irish. Um, another group, uh, a group of um, genocide survivors from Bosnia uh, presented a, a call to the court to allow relief for Palestinians. So it's like South Africa is also through, through this one move. And again, we shouldn't give South Africa too much credit for this, but what they did at that point was to sort of figure out how to reimagine a new kind of global politics. Because generally they could say, oh, it's just the global south and dismiss it. But now you have an Irish lawyer, you have Bosnians in it. Then you have other countries like Namibia who also, when Germany was trying to play sort of moral arbiter, South Africa, your case doesn't count. The Namibians jumped up and said, well, you practice genocide first on us in 1902, 1904. So there's like, there's a very interesting thing that was opened up by this, this moment by South Africa. Sama, did you want to say? Yes. Uh, sorry, I have a delay here. But uh, so can I just ask a couple of questions, Sean and, and Tony? One question is, is it is it wrong to think that the South African case was also motivated by by a sense of maybe this is there's no way to prove this, but a sense of 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 settling scores for Israel's relationship with apartheid South Africa for decades and decades and decades and is that part of the reason also for the ICJ case? In other words, South Africa representing the oppressed of the world, given the fact that Israel for decades had a relationship with apartheid South Africa. And I'm wondering if that's part of, of that, of that uh, story. But I actually had a couple of other questions, which I would love to get your, your, your thoughts on, uh, based on what you said earlier, which is when you mentioned the fact that in the 1970s and 80s, South African players uh, in Europe or in England playing uh, in this context of a growing sort of uh, attempt to call attention to apartheid in South Africa. Um, I'm wondering how you think about the situation of Palestinians. In other words, Palestinian, the, the fact that, that today it seems to me that there is a, there is an extraordinary, was there an extraordinary identification with South Africa in Europe, apartheid South Africa in Europe, in a way that there is an extraordinary official identification with Israel? Does that make it a very different kind of struggle for Palestinians to get their message across for this idea of trying to call attention to the oppression and the similarities with South Africa? Do you see what I'm saying? So in other words, was there, other than in England, because Tony said England and the sort of the, the England and maybe Holland in terms of identification with, with, with apartheid South Africa, but was there a similar kind of support 
for South African apartheid across Europe and the United States in a way that we see for Israel officially? And does that make the case of the Palestinians that much more difficult? Tony, do you want to go first? You go first. I have some stuff to say, but you go first. Yeah. I just, I mean, I'll say a quick thing. I think, <clears throat> I think there was 100% uh, Cold War backing for the apartheid regime in South Africa from Reagan, from Kohl, from Thatcher, you know, across the governments of, of sort of the NATO countries. Uh, South Africa was an asset. But I don't think any of them actually carried their civil societies. They're citizens. The, the, just, the gap between the rulers and the ruled in that case was, was, was very sharp. I don't think much of the population of any of those countries had much uh, enthusiasm for apartheid South Africa. One, you, 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 you're right. There's definitely a racial element to this. There's a, there's a racial element and an identification by Euro-America with Israel. You could argue that that was that was initially actually the case um, when it came to South Africa, and if I if you want you know when Lisa would sport directly, when for example, uh, when the first sports boycotts happened by South Africa, so 1958 I think or 59 is when there's a first attempt at like, you know there should be a boycott of South Africa, and the point of it was to say, uh, just just quickly, um, black players should have the same access to international competitions as white South Africans did. So it wasn't initially, we need to ban South Africa. Um, it's only in the 1960s that that changes and they, they kind of make the connection to racism broadly within South African society. And that if we, we need to stop South Africa from participating in sport, you know, kick them out of sport. And one of the things that they found when they would, so what happened was a number of African countries had become independent. And so the sports boycott in South Africa linked up with these, with this, African countries, Asian countries, countries of the so-called global south. So they had bigger numbers in the IOC, not FIFA yet. That happens like another decade later. But they used the IOC to kick South Africa out of the Olympics in 64 and 68. But here's a key thing that I saw a stat the other day. They found that most, most, white, most white National Olympic committees generally sided with South Africa. So, so to your point, was there something like the kind of support that Israel enjoys Officially, yes, there was. Until the end of the 1960s, South Africa or white South Africa, there was a connection to Europe and America that, that was very obvious. Also, and to, the, to Tony's point about the Cold War, not just the Cold War, uh, Nixon, Reagan, there's documentary evidence in the way that they talked about South Africa as our, I think there's this kit and kin was the sort of British language from British right wingers. But I think Reagan at one point referred to them as like my South African, I'm going to paraphrase, like almost sort of like our South African cousins or our South African brothers. This is like into the 1980s when they were doing the so-called constructive engagement, which is we need to talk to the South Africans, convince them, sort of Biden policy. We need to convince them to do to, to take a, a different tack. So, yes, there was I would say there was an official relationship with South Africa that lasted until the late 1980s. Sanctions. The sanctions regimes took forever to get the U.S. 1986, I think, is the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act. But Tony is correct. The populations were different. And I think Tony said this at some point. We should figure out how to focus on, like, mass movements and people because that was the key difference with South Africa. The people had made the break with the states, with their governments, about how they related to South Africa. And I think that's... So, somehow at the moment, even if that's not, even if that's the case, that there's a difference between how masses of people in these European and American countries, uh, US and European countries relate to Israel, what happens with the official media, with the state, with their mainstream media, is they create this idea that there's this like symbiotic link between the population, the state and Israel, when that might not actually be the case. And we should, well, Boycotters or campaigners for Palestine might have to take advantage of that, of that, where, where that break happens. I, just to, to, to add, sorry, two things. I know we're monopolizing this a little, but that I think that um, it's correct to say that there are more obstacles in the way of the Palestinian case for, for in, in the sense, which is 
in, in Europe in particular, not, not outside of Europe, in Europe and, and in the United States, obviously, the Israelis have very effectively um, engineered Holocaust guilt as, as like a trump card. And so, you know, and it's, it's kind of like, basically, Israel is a product of Western anti-Semitism in, in every sense. Like, I think one thing that nobody wants to talk about anymore, and I can see why the Zionists don't want to talk about it, is that without, you know, without American anti-Semitism uh, expressed through <clears throat> 1925 immigration quotas that kick in, I would, I would argue it's a counterfactual, but it, it's, to me, quite unlikely that, is, that the Zionist project would ever have created, achieved a critical mass of European Jewish immigrants. Because this was, by a, a factor of 100 to 1, the United States was the overwhelming preference of Eastern European Jews migrating. And it's only uh, when the doors are shut, and they're not even opened after the Holocaust. So putting all that aside, there's, so there's this tremendous Holocaust guilt that Israel <clears throat> can, can operationalize and weaponize. And then the other thing is that basically... Um, from the colonial era to to you know to the post war to the war on terror era, if we want to use that 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 term, there's there's a sort of Islamophobia that uh, is activated by kind of Western powers since <clears throat> 2001 in particular, more and more aggressively. And we've sort of noticed uh, you know what's happening in France, for example. It's just like in in FIFA, France can have the most disgusting, racist, bigoted, Islamophobic policies in its football system nobody's even talking about that in 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 fifa and again uh you know the the palestinian issue is not is not an issue of religion we know that but they but obviously the israelis want to, and the zionists cast it in, in that way and again so that makes the the terrain more difficult of course the flip side of that is also true boycotts are most effective most effective when they they essentially withdraw something on which a regime has been reliant so like in the case of say you know in 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 the when the Reagan no, was actually the Bush administration or the Reagan when they don't do the loan guarantees when they 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 basically <clears throat> step away from protecting South Africa from financial sanctions that's a huge blow because it's a sudden withdrawal of something on which they've been <clears throat> been relying so Israel is in a situ is, a, is extremely vulnerable to things being withdrawn I mean and they free you know being settler colonial psyche. Uh, the settlers really need to feel like they're part of the West in which, they, in which their whole structure of identity and legitimacy for themselves exists. In the, you know, in the way that the conquistadores needed the Catholic Church to bless their violence against the indigenous people, um, the, the Zion, say modern settler colonial uh, regimes need the sense of this Western, you know, mission civilisatrice in, in the French ter uh, term, this idea that essentially the violence they are waging is necessary and blessed and legitimized. So anything that comes from the West that says, whoa, 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 you guys are like out of line, you're not, we are not part of, this is not us. That's a huge psychological blow to a, a, a settler colonial um, regime. So, you know, when Lord, the New Zealand musician, cancels a tour that's like a, you know there's a major national like crisis uh triggered by by that and football you know that is the language of of uh that's the language that's gonna that's gonna hurt the, the is if they anything they lose any access they lose to european football uh is gonna resonate very very powerfully with israeli civil society i think and this is also another so slight difference is formally Israel is part of UEFA. South Africa was nominal. Well, it, it was part of the, the African, it, you know, if it wanted to participate in global competitions, it had to play through Africa. The original, the first South, in 1956, when the Confederation of African Football is founded, South Africa is actually a founding member. It wants to send a white team to the first tournament an all white team and it's told, no, you can't. And they expel them. So South Africa is part of Africa. Israel had been part of Asia, I think, until 1974 when they get when they get thrown out of the Asian Games, and then they come back after 1991. They start playing in European competitions, and I think after 94 club competitions, and after 94 the national team. So that's that's what makes it even to to Tony's point. Yeah, that's this part of this sort of political identification is with Europe, but that makes it also very difficult to dis, to 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 dislodge or to get Israel suspended because Europe. The UEFA, um, while they were quick to go after Russia or they quick to go after other countries, they seem to be very reluctant um, to go after Israel. So you cannot. So when your sports strategy happens, going through UEFA or attacking UEFA is is probably not the 
you know, the most efficient way to run this campaign. It's there has to be others. There has to be other places that campaigners will have to look like. Probably the IOC, the Olympic Games. Um, but I think the FIFA is much harder because of UEFA seems to, if you look at UEFA for the last couple of months, like uh, during the international break, they make like special accommodations for Israel to play its games out in Hungary, which is another bizarre story that Hungary is uh, the protector of Israel when Hungary is like one of the most anti-Semitic countries in Europe. So there's there's just the way that the formal structures of Europe uh, kind of also complicates this, this question you ask, like what what makes what's what's different between the South African case and the, and, and Israel when it comes to Europe, apart South African apartheid and Israeli apartheid is also that Israel is formally in terms of sports, it is formally part of Europe. It's not part of Asia. If it was part of Asia, it wouldn't be playing internationally. But because Europe is tolerating it, it can play in Europe. That's that's a thank you both. That's a that's a very helpful kind of overview. We'll come back to the contemporary uh, campaign for boycott in a little bit. But just to to go to touch uh, back on the history, uh, even even briefly, I mean, part, Sean, part of what you were saying there is that the first move for boycott, if I got you right was in the 60s even? Which no, is 50s, early, 57, right? 58. 50s, yeah. okay. Yeah. 57, 58, and then again, 60s, and it comes back. And we remember, I mean, I'm older than my brothers, but I remember, of course, the peak of the anti-apartheid struggle in the 80s. And by then it was almost, you know, the, the people had been won over. It was the governments at that point, the Reagan and Thatcher governments that were lagging. But what part of what's interesting is that at, Palestinians often think of South Africa as a kind of precedent. Like the South Africans showed us the path in all kinds of ways. But part of what's interesting about when we when you put these two histories together is that, of course, apartheid was formalized in 1948, the year of the Nakba in Palestine, right? And it's so, and yet, nevertheless, and this I think maybe speaks to what Osama is talking about too. And yet, nevertheless, the first calls for boycott, as you said, were 50s and then 60s. Like in other words, the South Africans, the the movement to begin boycotting South Africa because of apartheid began. Within, within 10 years or so after the formalization of apartheid, right? Whereas, and in the case of Israel, yeah, there have been calls, but like nothing like what happened in the case, like now. So this is, all I guess like I'm pointing to is this really weird lag between two sets of racial racialized forms of oppression, two forms of apartheid, really, that actually began in the same year but one ran its course much more quickly, and the other one is just now. It's like I think the 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 genocide in Gaza is pushing things over the edge now, in a way that do you see what I'm saying? Like kind of, these things are sort of out of sync with each other. I guess I guess that's what I'm saying. They're a little bit out of sync with each other. So I guess my real question is, do you think now because of the genocide in Gaza, we've reached the kind of tipping point where the Palestinian push for boycotts? against apartheid Israel, it, at least, let's just talk about sports and nothing else, uh, is now kind of where the South Africa, like if we were to find a parallel, is it like South Africa, is it like the South African moment of the 80s? Or like, where do you, where do you think we are in terms of the, the so, if we can make a comparison? If it's about, if it's about sport, and I think Tony has, Tony has, maybe he might have a different opinion. So just to go back to what you're describing. So if you, the late 1950s, as I said, it's South Africa just passed laws to segregate sports. You have to play separate sports, separate associations. So that's when the, the focus is, okay, so that's nonsense. Everybody should have a chance to, an equal chance, and they should be participating in the national teams. What changes it, and I think to your point is like, where, so if, if we ask like, where are we now? If we, if we had to make an historical comparison, there's, I think there's two key elements that happened at the end of the 50s and the beginning of the 60s. The one is, that turned to sort of mass political struggle in South Africa. I mean, it gets then uh, eclipsed by the government uh, coming down on on protests, arresting people, people going into exile and into jail. But in the moment just before that, in the lead up to that first sports, like what is sports activism? There is mass political activity in South Africa. There's like, there's there's about three or four moments in South Africa, it's modern history where there's like internally mass political activity, equivalent of like an intifada, if you want. It's the early to like, from the early 50s to the end of the 50s, 
Then it again happens in the 1980s. There's one little moment in the mid 1970s, but with trade unions and then student movements, but it's really the 50s and the 80s where there's mass political political activity. But the other part that happens in the early, at the end of, end of the 50s, early 60s, is decolonization. So there's, so the, so it's a local environment of mass movements and globally, there's all these African countries, Asian countries that gain their independence, that become really vocal in international organizations like the UN, the IOC, you know, like if, if well, the, the political organizations, super, not super national political organizations and sports organizations. And the, the, the sports campaigners in South Africa, they identify that moment. They see that moment in the early 1960s and say, we should take advantage of the fact that there is this, it was, I think it's called the Supreme Council for Sport in Africa. There's the, the beginnings of the Asian, the Asians are organizing themselves in terms of sport. So it's like they take advantage of the numbers. Every country has one vote and they use that within the structures of the, of the IOC. And all those same kind of things where you, where, you know, we can visit, revisit that 2015, 2017 attempt by FIFA to go after Israel for how it uh, it's organizing games in the occupying territories. This is the famous one where a South African government minister, former government minister, Tokyo Sekhwali gets appointed. But there is something like that in South Africa, also in the early, particularly in the early 60s, where FIFA, UA, FIFA, sorry, IOC, they send they send delegations of people to go look as to whether South Africa is flouting the rules about racism, discrimination in sport. But I think, so So my, my response to you, my quick answer is, it could be that it, it, in a way, it's the 1960s in terms of like the sports movement. And then what kind of, I see Tony shaking his head. But here's what I think is what's interesting. After that, after using those state organizations to pull off this, if you want, coup to get South Africa kicked out of the Olympics, 64, 68. Then there's a there's a there's another movement after that. Right after that, Dennis Brutus, who's sort of the face of this campaign, and a younger uh, liberal white South African guy called Peter Hain, they realize that okay, we've got the Olympics. Now we have to shift. Tony's point about when you pick football, something that Israelis, these Israeli clubs who play in Europe, the national team, the affinity, the fact that they hold on to that, suddenly. Peter Hain and Peter Bruce said, let's go after sports that white South Africans care about. So they didn't really care about football, except for some this English speaking, parts of English speaking South Africa who love football. There's, you know, cricket and rugby. So the focus by the end of the 60s shifted to cricket and rugby sports that mattered to white South Africans. And where did that campaign emerge? In the diaspora. So there are these like young South Africans Peter Hain is studying in England and they begin to organize themselves. And they just, they didn't say like, they just named the thing, stop the 70 tour. And they just went after a series of, of uh, a rugby tour, cricket tours. And that's the last time I think that South Africa played in Britain. I think until the, until, until after apartheid was over. So 1970, boom, cut, they cut off rugby right there. Now it didn't, that wasn't necessarily the end of all tours. New Zealand still came to South Africa, I think, in 76, right before the Soweto uprising, 77. Um, and then South Africa went to make one last tour um, in New Zealand. And I'll stop with this one. That tour, and this might be also, this is also if you look for parallels again, that's the tour of television, today's equivalent of the internet. So up until then, South Africans, when you read about these tours or you read about the racism of South African sport, you had to read about it in the newspaper. Other people might have TV where South Africa goes to play, but South Africans didn't see any of this. And so there's research that shows white South Africans, and I've spoken to friends who are my age and older and asked them, like, how did you view that? How did your family view white South Africans? How did you view this tour? And they were like, I'm sitting, I'm watching it with my dad, we're watching the rugby or my mom. And we're seeing these protesters run on the field, disrupting the games, uh, uh, you know, doing pamphlet bombings, whatever. And we have to ask our parents, like, yo, what, what is this? Why are these people, why don't they like us? 
And so it has a psychological effect because it's like it's like in front of you all the time. So my my short answer after my my long my long talk sounds like I gave a talk here is it's I think it's it's both one and it's both the early sixties the end of the fifties early sixties if you take a look at for like the comparison but it's also it's also the nineteen eighties it's also the like there's now all this media that can disrupt this narrative. That's easy. You can easily dismiss it. You can't do that anymore. Like people can see it in front of them. They can watch it on. The Which screen. is why it's not. To, I mean, long lags. Is it the sixties? Whatever. No, it's the age of TikTok. It's the age of social media. It, it, like it, time and history has been so rapidly compressed and accelerated that I would say yes, the Gaza moment is that global moment where everybody is stirred to action. Uh, you know, whatever affinities go out the window. The, the Israelis, the Zionists are so freaked out by social media precisely because they can't control the narrative. They can't control uh, what's happening. So uh, that absolutely, this the Gaza moment. And I think what, uh, what it behooves us to think about is that the institutional parts are ones that the Zionists and Israel and their allies can very easily control. They knock it out. In, so basically, Israel is completely in violation and has been for decades. Of, of all FIFA sta- of all sorts of FIFA statutes, doesn't matter. They they just like in 2015, it's an open and shut case. But they just shelve it. Like literally, Jibril Rajoub, head of the uh, PFA or former head of the Mukbarat in the West Bank, just does like, okay, sorry, we we're withdrawing that now. Like, um, and it goes away because you can control what happens in institutions. And the, yes, the institutions are completely hypocritical. I mean, there's absolutely no question. Look at what they did with Russia over Ukraine. Look at what they've done with Israel. It's like, again, open and shut, but they don't care. They don't care until they have to. And that, that's why you have to basically, in order to create a sports boycott or to create these effects, it's mass organization, it's grassroots pressure, it's building a movement that makes it uncomfortable for uh, things to continue as, as normal. And, you know, you can see so much potential right now. Like there's so every, besides marching for Palestine, right, which people are doing all over the world, and that's fantastic. Trans, how, how does that get translated into longer term political organization? Um, you know, sports boycott stuff, cultural boycott stuff creates forms of action that very, that ordinary people can do. They're very low bars uh, to, to, to entry, that you're creating mechanisms to organize people in the diaspora, Palestinians in the diaspora, but also that global solidarity community. You know, I met someone a few weeks ago, like a social justice activist um, from New Zealand who's engaged on like Palestine stuff and so on. And I mentioned this stuff and she just said uh, in, in passing, you know, actually I got my start in activism in Heart, which is Halt All Racist Tours, which is what Sean was referencing, the New Zealand group that disrupted and literally stopped the 1981 rugby tour. So you could see how that works, that like politicization around a very specific sports question creates a lifelong activist on all sorts of social justice causes. So, you know, I think among the fans globally and also among the players, like so many players have stepped up, but it feels to me, I mean, I might be wrong, I might not know, maybe there are structures, but it feels like there's no structure that's actually um, supporting players coming forward that's encouraging others to come forward because there's a safe space for them. There's a space of solidarity among players. What Fede Canute tried to do when the UEFA Under-21 tournament was being held in Israel, like organize the players to take stands and create channels of solidarity between them to reinforce that. Um, you know, I think this kind of building sports boycott organization is, is multi-layered and it has to work on all of these levels. It has to work on the institutional level, but it has to create the pressure on the institutions. And I think, uh, sorry, this is just, this is a long rant, but it's not a long, um, basically the power of civil society in football is very, very clear. Like if you look at things like when they try to um, organize the, you know, the owners of the Premier League were going into this European thing and the fans was like, just no, like, sorry, we're not, we're not having it. And it goes. It, it gets withdrawn because the fans are so much part of the chemistry of what makes the TV rights so valuable. That you know, if football was played in empty stadiums, it wouldn't. You know, the TV rights wouldn't be worth billions and billions of dollars. It's like the fans are part of the chemistry of the spectacle that you're selling. So the fans have that that power, and then players had also stepped up in solidarity on that particular issue. 
uh, that issue, you know, is a narrow football issue. Uh, who's going to own football, how it's going to be played. But it shows you the potential. It shows you the real power that uh, fans and players have potentially. So you want, you want to go ahead or shall I? I... Yeah, yeah, just a quick, actually, just a quick, just specifically on this exact, on the, the business of fans specifically, then Kenny has a, another question we want to get back to. But on the question of fans specifically, it's interesting that, I mean, I don't know how much fan activism there has been. And this is just purely anecdotally, and I think Kerim will back me up on this too, that some of the Arsenal podcasts, I mean, I'm sure you guys listen to Liverpool podcasts. We listen to Arsenal podcasts. So part of what's been actually quite dismaying about what's happening now, the way it filters through or rather doesn't filter through to Arsenal podcasts. For example, there's a couple of Arsenal podcasts, like the Arsenal Vision and, and Ars Blog and so forth, that when other kind of other sorts of traumatic events happen, like the, the earthquake in Syria and Turkey and other kinds of things and so forth. They're very quick to say it. I, I always felt good as an Arsenal fan that the Arsenal fan community is kind of attentive to social injustice. And, and they've always been very good, you know, gay rights, all kinds of things, right? But not as far as I know, those podcasts haven't said a thing about Gaza, not a word. So I'm wondering whether there's a, whether at least in terms like, who knows how representative these people are after all. But I wonder whether there is kind of fan mobilization. I mean, Celtic obviously is a, is a super exception. But but other than that, I don't know how much fan mobilization there is. There was that moment when players, who was it? It was the Leicester City player when they won the FA Cup. Wasn't it the FA Cup or something? Yeah, exactly. Had the Palestinian flag. There's a few things like the World Cup and Qatar and so forth. There's a little bit, but like fan, I, I don't know how... I mean, I'd like to have more faith in fan communities. I, I don't know how well, that we yeah, can I, yet. I don't, Kenny, yeah, but I don't know, what do you think about I, that from I, an I Arsenal perspective? I want to add to this. It's not, not necessarily from an Arsenal perspective because perhaps I don't have this kind of expectation from certain kinds of podcasts or certain you know people like this. They you know they they don't want to alienate. There's a I, I can understand that. Uh, the comparison eventually, I think we're going to talk about, has to come up, which is the comparison with Ukraine rather than the Syria earthquake, for example. It's more. It's really more the Ukraine thing because. The power, it's not a natural disaster type thing. We're talking about a, an, a, an invasion and occupation and this kind of very overt way in which, uh, especially the European football players, as well as, or at least the players went along with it, but certainly organized from above the institution the, the, in England and other places where there was just, you know, Ukrainian flags and, and this, you know, this, this incredible solidarity that came out. Uh, and, and as you both said, Deshaun and... and, and uh, and Tony, you guys, you know, said it. It's it, which, which I want to come back to actually. But, but let, let's get through this, which is this notion of the Israelis basically being European now, right? They're playing in the since the nineties. They've been playing in the European Federation. So there's no reason that they should not be also addressed in this way as Europeans, not as just solidarity with some like you know some African thing or some random Asian Arab thing. No, as a European thing in Europe, they play in Europe, they play the Champions League, they play the Europa Cup, they play in the national federations, etc. And so, the, okay, so we can talk about uh, double standard, etc. But, you know, so so there's this. The other part of this, and you guys are, are, are at least partly journalists, uh, which is which is the way in which the Western journalists patrol this, like the Guardian in particular. I'm thinking the Guardian should have a lot of football coverage. And, it, you know, uh, the, for example, around the question of the Qatar World Cup, where it was endlessly, endlessly, endless wall-to-wall, 24-7 coverage of how shitty the Qataris were and how terrible the Arab world is and the Islamic world, is, et cetera, and gay rights, et cetera. And it's not that it's not true. I mean, of course, it's, it's a question of, of the extent to which they were allowed, editorial and otherwise, to, to generalize and to kind of orientalize the whole situation. While at the same time, and I tried this on, on Twitter and other things to try to engage with these guys and didn't get very far, which is, okay, fine, say that, but what about the Israelis? What about the others? I mean, you, 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 know, you can't have it both ways. And so this, this business of, of the, the, the Western press, the institutions, the formal institutions like FIFA, like UEFA, like the Premier League or, and the FA and all of these, and on the other hand, even in the Arab world, you got this, the trend towards normalization among the Arab states themselves. So you have perhaps, unlike the South African case in the 70s or 80s, I, as I understand it, but correct me if I'm wrong, where you had a kind of African, pan-African solidarity of sort, even at the official level. Here, you're, you're having a problem, which is that the pan-Arab now in the post-1990s, and especially in the last, you know, last 10, 15 years, you have a reverse. You have a reversal where it's all about the normalization 
some shy, some not so shy, normalization. So they don't want to disrupt this. On the contrary, they're inviting the Israeli teams, the Israeli tennis players, things like this to come through. Whereas this huge popular anger in the Arab world towards this and huge disapproval uh, of, of this kind of normal, even in Saudi Arabia, huge disapproval, uh, as all the polls show, of normalization with Israelis. So, but, but you're going to have this official crackdown. You have, when the expression is allowed, like at the Qatar World Cup, the Morocco team, which was this fairy tale, you know, performance in the World Cup. They reached, I think it was the semifinals. Uh, and throughout it, it was, and I wasn't there. I went to a couple of games. I mean, the, the kind of, the, the atmosphere, the way in which those, the Moroccan team was taken at, at, and, and became like the team at, at the World Cup and the, the, the Moroccan fans and the way the players brought out the Palestinian flag what was, was, was really, you know, extraordinary and shows that if you allow, if you leave it to the people, this is what happens. But between the media crackdown, between the institutional crackdown, and between the Western kind of forcefulness, because all these players have to play in the West. In reality, if you want money, you go to England, you go to France, you go to Belgium, you go to Holland. And that's the, the African and North, as far as the Arabs are concerned, the North African route in, into Europe. So there's a, I don't know what I'm asking here, but there's a lot. So I just wanted to add that. Please. No, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll be quick. I'll say, I'll say something quick. I'm actually astonished, and I'd be curious to your response to this, why the Qatar... So I felt that, I think I read stuff, for example, people would say Palestine was the 33rd team at that World Cup. I mean, it just seemed that there was a... There were these social media videos of Israeli journalists being... I was trying to interview people, and people were like, no, nah, I don't want to be... I don't want to talk to you, or... Uh, Free Palestine. So like some Bolivian dude or some English guy just says that back into the camera. He was like, huh? So there was this, there was, I, this, this goes back to this, the first question about the question about uh, the, the, the fans. And then, which I think I'm getting to that question, which is we're, we're like, so there's only the Celtic is an exception, but in general, it's impossible. The stadiums are controlled. You can't bring in a flag, but here was a moment it was a moment I felt in which the, a World Cup, the premier stage, everybody was watching, and it was clear Palestine had won the rhetorical, if you want, like war at that moment. And I was just like, that should have been exploited more. I don't know by who, like formal organization, like what is the nature of the formal like, organization around boycott? But I was like, there, that's it, right there. Somebody should have jumped on that energy of Palestine is the 33rd team of the World Cup. Uh, it, everybody, it was clear to everybody, like, who are the victims in this situation? And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I don't have the answer, but I'm curious from, from, from you guys, like, why that moment wasn't being capitalized. And just to, to, to continue, because I think that answers that question about... And just before you answer, just before Tony, just before Tony answer, just sorry, before you answer, Tony... I agree with everything you said, and I don't. I don't think I want to spend my energy trying to convince the Guardian to because they're not going to. And I don't. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm not. I. I. We are in the same. I agree with everything you said there. So I'm more interested in like those other spaces where we could but have done something. That's the point something. because look at the Guardian's coverage of what's happening in Gaza right now, and it's got the, some of the same characteristics of that kind of British BBC. Well, of course, you know the Hamas run health ministry, all this kind of crap of like basically you have to sanitize what the Israelis are doing. The Guardian's still doing that, and I mean we know people who work at the Guardian. You know how hard it is. It's like any of the Western press, but that hasn't changed what's happening in the civil society spaces because the you know tiktok and and instagram and those things that just bypass all the gatekeeping of the conventional media so what i'll say when you're asking where are the fan where's the fan activism well i'm like where is the structure where is the movement that's inviting people that's creating a conceptual space that if i am an arsenal fan group somewhere or that i am a a, a west bromwich albion fan group or an aston villa fan group what, you, know, you, you know, you'll never walk alone. It's like, well, if there's no structure into which fans can express their support for something, it needs the structure. It needs like, there is this national, I mean, I'm just hyper, hypothesizing here, but you, you get five big name players like to call for something, that for fans to take this and this and this action, right? And so you, you create a space, you're inviting people to respond to something. And you're also making it clear that you're not just sticking your head up, you know, Gary Lineker sticks his head up, and he gets a, a, a clap, as we say, 
um, back home. But it's kind of like the more people are doing that and the more there's a space that invites people to do that. It's like, I, I mean, I really believe that the energy is there and the potential is there, but the structure, there's no structure that I can see. And if I was a BDS activist, I'd be thinking football is an absolute, should be an absolute priority, both because of uh, the vulnerability of the Israelis psychically, psychologically, in a way that's going to hurt them a lot more than, than you know, hummus being boycotted, like Israeli branded hummus. Um, you know, b being like seeing that the spectacle of their football connection being being challenged, that's going to that's going to be really you know painful. And then the other thing is there's that. But then there's the potential the, that essentially you've had so many people signaling their willingness to do something. But it's like, what is something? Something has to be organized. Something has to be you, you, you need a, a, a structure in, that invites people to to participate in, in some way and, and create multiple levels of, of involvement. But, you know, just looking at the players, like where is the structure of solidarity among players? Um, it's not going to happen spontaneously. It needs to, the spontaneous side is the, is the energy that's there. That's, that's told us it's there. Like what we saw. And also, also take, take, take advantage. The structures can also take advantage of like, again, moments. So Palestine's national football team after the Asian cup, Super popular, gets invited to South Africa, um, which I, I've seen an article by two friends of mine who just wrote an article. They went to the match and they kind of tried to unpack it. And they just said, like, the energy, they felt like how it reflected something both within South African society, what was going on in South Africa, but Palestine again. But just like the national team can go around and popularize like the Algerians did um, during their liberation struggle where the team started traveling around the world, these players who played in Europe, et cetera, withdrew from their teams and traveled. Now, it will not be exactly the same thing because there is a formal structure. I saw the other day the Irish FA announced that an Irish selection might play the Palestinian national team in Ireland. So that's use the football, the stadium. That's an official game. People are going to go to this game. They can actually bring the flag. It's going to be all of the internet, the visuals of it, the visuals of the visit to South Africa was all of the internet. You saw visuals of Palestinian, the one that I love the most, Palestinian players arrive at this castle, which was the first colonial settlement in Cape Town in South Africa during slavery. And there were these musicians from, who are descendants of slaves playing what they call like the guma. It's a, it's a kind of a sound of music on drums. And these players are walking in and they beaming. And I was just like, I saw that repeated on social media when they arrive at the airport. So there's like, there are ways to do the formal, because there is a PFA, there is a team. It has formal representation. It's not playing in Europe, but it could play friendlies. We know which countries could play friendlies against them. Then there's this kind of energy of like the populace. And as I said, okay, the Qatar moment is now past. There was the Asian... Uh, uh, cup moment too, but which is more like to a region. But there is something about using using that World Cup. I think was a such an incredible moment to just grasp her energy, as Tony says, figure out an organizational form for it. Like there had to be an organization. Maybe it, it's not BDS. It's something like a the spectacle of. I mean, for Palestinians everywhere to see a stadium full of people in Cape Town singing Biladi Biladi. I mean, it's like wow, like. You know, it's really, I think, powerful also showing people they're not alone. As Liverpool fans like to. The war on loneliness. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think, um, I mean, I think that this, this is the ultimate question that, you know, how does one create this kind of structure? Right? This is, this is the, this is where we are. I. Uh, I, I think these structures, and I said we can talk now. You know, we can move to the to the you know maybe more specific questions of the BDS and how how football can be kind of carried within this larger BDS movement. Uh, I, I'm, you know, we, we see now. Okay, so there's you know, it's I'd be remiss if I didn't mention you know what's going on in Gaza today, just in terms of the football, where we have um, uh, Muhammad Barakat, who was you know quite a quite a well known. Uh, Palestinian, or he used to play for the for the you know Palestinian football team. Uh, he was nicknamed the Lion, and uh, you know he used to play for 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 Shabab Khan Yunus. And according to the to the website, anyway, he's the first player in Gaza 
to score more than 100 goals for a single team. So the first Palestinian in that, in that way. And so, you know, he had he carried a certain thing. And there was this very moving video, you know, one of these videos where he was, he, he filmed himself uh, just before he died. He was killed right after he filmed himself and uploaded it. And he just sort of, you know, this is the noise, the, the shelling in the background. And, you know, he would pause every few seconds and sort of look back because it was getting closer and closer and closer. And he was basically saying, this is it. This, these are my last moments. And, you know, and he just sort of, please accept my, you know, it, it, it was extremely moving and, and very, very difficult to, to be able to kind of take that and, 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 um, and see how this stuff gets either blocked as it goes for, sort of gets blocked or people just put it aside, you know, and you, you, you know, I just was reading that there's now officially 158 athletes, Palestinian athletes, recognized athletes who were killed and including 91 football players who have been killed in, in, in Gaza, uh, not to mention pre-October 2023 with Israelis regularly destroying the football infrastructure, stopping people from kind of, you know, e even as the Palestine national team would go somewhere, you know, they would kind of block roadblocks or this kind of thing, it stopped them from going anywhere. And so the, the, this, this divorcing in a sense of the solidarity in general with how do you mobilize except in certain locations like in the celtic or ireland and you know south africa ireland certain kinds of places like this which have this history they have this old history it is this kind of old anti-colonial history uh which, which is incredible and, and very very important but in terms of expanding that the natural place first of all be in the arab world and that's why i think the importance of the qatar world cup you know it's the first time you have a in, in the arab world and it's placed and you saw the kind of result that happened and it was spontaneous it's not just, oh, it's Qatar and this kind of thing where people try to say, oh, Qatar kind of organized this and because they're trying to make it. No, it, it, it was, I was there. It was spontaneous. It was incredible. And it was joined by all the different fans, the Argentinians and the others, the all kind of the Mexicans. You know, everybody kind of came through and, and the African teams, they all sort of, you know, participated. It was, it was quite, quite joyous and, and there, was no, there was no repression. There was no crackdown. I think that was essential. So when, when you look at what's going on, when even uh, who was it? It was um, uh, 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 what's his name in Yusuf Atal uh, in in Nice and uh, and Anwar Ghazi in in Mainz in the German teams, and these are just the two that I know of, and I'm sure there are others who were suspended from their teams post October simply for their kind of solidarity on on Facebook or on kind of some kind of social, just like a brief solidarity thing. There was the the case of the French part, one of the guys in the French Senate going after, uh, uh, you know, going after, a very, going after Benzema and saying they have to strip him of, of his citizenship. Like, the guy's French. What do you mean strip him of his, like send them back to Algeria or something like, you know, the guy's fully, fully French. What are you going to, you going to strip him of his citizenship and send them back? Like, okay, so these things, and now I'm just reading yesterday, I think it was yesterday where they where the, the French are like banned for the under-19 French team. They banned, you can't fast during Ramadan now. You can't fast as you're going into the tournament. So you, you get these kinds of things. And so you got, so how, how does, how does, how do players, we were talking about the play, how do the players show solidarity? Okay, Frederick Canuti is an ex-player now. So you've got some people like that. But how are these players in your experience or, or, or they're, you're looking around that maybe I can't see, the players themselves who might also lead the fans at a certain level. So you've got the fans who might lead and then you've got the players who, who, who will lead, you know? So these guys are being cracked down at an incredible pace. And you look at the Morocco, the 90% of the Moroccan team go back and have to play in Spain and France and England and these, or Germany and these kinds of countries. And they know their contracts, their livelihood, their, their uh, uh, everything around them is being heavily, heavily, heavily patrolled. So, I, of course, I don't have an answer. So I'm, I'm throwing it back. How does one bring together the fans, bring together these players to open up the space outside of the older kind of anti-colonial countries like Ireland and South Africa, which is a kind of natural thing. Um, okay, I, I can go first. I thought Tony was going to go first, but I can go first quickly. So on this one, I think I'm less, pes I, I'm more pessimistic. So, and I, and I'll have, and then I'll have a little thing at the end where I think it might do better. I'm talking about players. I think players, because of the, they're in the 1970s, 19, you know, 60s and 70s, 80s. There, there were more players who could be outspoken, whether it was Paul Bremer or go people question whether Paul uh, Breitner, I think it is, whether he was yeah, actually Paul that radical. Socrates. Maradona. Socrates. Yeah, Maradona. Yeah, Maradona, Socrates. I think the, the, the relationship of the player to the club, to the public, to the press, they had a lot more freedom to express themselves politically. I'm, I'm actually 
Socrates is my my god, like I worship at his church. So Socrates, Maradona, that was like a, I think the time was different. Now there's a lot more control over their time, over their image. Uh, uh, the club has a lot more, you know, the clubs, what were they run by? I think they, they linked into these, uh, into political systems. Uh, it's linked to like the, the, the kind of money the club makes. So like clubs don't want to do with anything political, whether it's, whether it's Palestine or not, anything. They try to make the players as bland as possible. And occasionally if a player seems to step out of that, Marcus Rashford, when he took on the English, the British government over, over uh, school lunches, uh, at some level, people were like okay with him, but of course, this is part of football. If you start losing, if you're not doing very well, then people say, "Hey, people expect footballers just to play football and not do anything else." So if they don't, they don't do. If, if they start playing badly, then they go after you, and that happened to to Rashford. And sadly, well, not sadly, he got his mojo back against us. So I'm not very happy that he's got a little bit of a his, his respite came because uh, they beat Liverpool. In the in the FA Cup, so somehow Marcus Rashford is okay again, but still he's had a hard time being, being um, having political thoughts. And I say this also to say one other quick thing because before I get to my last part, which is people are people people sort of expect that a player of Arab descent is going to say something. So there was they and they did it at a cost that, as you said, as you showed, like mines. Like told Al Ghazi, we ending your contract, so it's, it, it's not a, it's not always beneficial to them. But it seems Arab players like stick their necks out, and there was some commentary. I think Lilian Turam asked this question about another time about French racism or racism in European football, which is why are, why do you expect black players to be the ones to speak up about racism and not other players? So there's that question. I think I think why is it the pessimism? I'm. I would like to see a white player. I would like to see white European players like step up. I mean, and I, at this point, because of what I just described, I think it's very difficult to see who's going to be that, who's going to be those players. What's the spaces they're going to speak up. But here's where I see the, 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 the quick thing where I think there is a possibility. The, when the average black player, young, uh, try to speak up about racism, they were always ridiculed. Raheem Sterling, they were unfavorably compared with white players. They were like, why are you complaining? Stop complaining, this, that, and the other. But if there's like, to, to your point about the fan and the player and who's leading, when Raheem Sterling, I think he gave this like interview where he really spoke explicitly and he showed, he, he actually showed like how racist the media was in, the, in his comparison with him and Phil Foden, about him buying his mama house, Phil Foden buying his mama house, and how the media was targeting him. And he won the public over on the question of racism in British football and how it treats its black players. So something happened there. If, if, if there's a player that can come out and speak up about this and there's like a public, the public moves with them, then other players, because now it's like normalized, like for black players to talk about racism and even white players to say that there's racism in football. They all bring out, every time now racism happens, they come down on the racism. So something's just got to give... I think with white players, and then maybe there's there's kind but of. But I think I, I mean, again, I don't know the you know. I, I mean, I hope some of this is happening. But some of the players you mentioned there, like Lilian Turam, is a great social justice anti-colonial activist. Like you need a bunch of senior figures that players can relate to. That you know. So basically, how, I mean, just thinking out loud, how would you go about this? Maybe when some of the African teams are meeting in their national teams that you have people who move into those spaces. Like, hey, guys, we're in the dressing room together. You're all at these European clubs, but look how Islamophobic the French uh, are. Look at what's happening in Palestine. What can we do? You need organization. You need, like, you know, Frank Ribéry was a white European. I mean, he did convert to Islam, so that's always how he's written of. But, you know, they're, they're players who... who uh, exactly. Exactly. And you, 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 so you could, I mean, basically what you need to do is create a, a, a structure among players where people are invited and, you know, and shown support. Um, because I don't believe, you know, I, yes, the players are, uh, the, the systems try to govern their personalities and keep them out of, you know, anything controversial. But, you know, the race thing is, is an obvious example of how that gets moved. And this should get moved also and can. 
if you have people taking it up, people who, who are not at risk of losing, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, did we ever figure out if Cristiano Ronaldo was genuinely supportive of Palestine or not? Because there was so much mythology around that, but, um, or, or Messi. <laughs> I was going to say, there's another exception of the modern era, which, which people always forget, uh, Zanetti and the Zapatistas. Zanetti who played uh, Zagreb and uh, Zanetti who played at Inter and who supported the Zapatistas in Mexico. So there's, there, there, uh, I think Tony's onto something when he says, yeah, you, you, oh, the, the, uh, Bellerin. Bellerin has made explicit comments. Hey, Hector Bellerin. Bellerin has made explicit comments about Palestine. Yeah, for us, for us, but I think the point Tony's trying to make is BDS as an organization or whatever is a stop is stop Israeli sport in Europe or something, whatever they're going to call this organization is going to be called, has to figure out that symbiotic relationship with those kind of figures and how to deploy them within the public. Like having a Lilian Taram like pitch up. Uh, and I think this, for example, Lilian Taram, he still speaks up. There's an issue right now in France where... There's a black singer that they would like her to sing at the opening ceremony of the Paris Olympics. And white French people are upset. She's of, I think, Senegalese descent, Aya Nakamura. And I've seen Lilian Turam is in the media just being blunt, you know, and going after, after races, going after critics, like telling the government to have a backbone on this. I mean, it's just, it's a pop culture moment. But just, there's some there's something about using figures like that in campaigns uh, in campaigns to get other younger scared players as just Tony said get them into the dressing room they convince these players that no I am with you I'll stand with you so there's something about what that can do politically I think uh, on behalf of, of my myself and my brothers we want to we want to thank you we want to thank you for coming on the show and talking about the South African experience and and you know where 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 the future might lie for for Palestine and the question of uh, boycotting Israeli participation in in world sports European sports to begin with and world sports uh, after that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you. Take it easy. <laughs> okay. Great. We love your show. See you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Okay, Sally. So, what did you think? I thought this was a, a like, you know fascinating show as usual. And of course, something that that we're all so passionate about. So, what what did you think? I thought it was. I mean, I thought it was great. A great conversation with 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 two sharp minds, obviously. And the, I mean, the question of sports is so important because, as Sean was saying, actually, both as both Sean and Tony were, they were both saying, the sense of feeling plugged into the world is really, really important for settler colonial societies. They want to feel that they're connected somehow to the mothership in one way or another. And, and so I, it's, it's super important. And, and you, and they react any form of isolation, you know, uh, when, when a musician doesn't play in, in Tel Aviv or whatever, they go, they go, they go, they go kind of nuts about it because I think they, they really fear isolation in that sense. And I think it's become really, really, really important. And then just talking with them, hearing the South African experience, you know, how it slowly built up over time, as they were saying, the 50s, 60s, it took a lot, it took longer than we sometimes think. It, it began in the 50s and it really reached its kind of climax the, with the general anti, anti-apartheid anti boycott campaign of the 1980s. That's a long time. That's 30, 40 years, you know, of of struggle. And so we, we have to be realistic. But I also think that the crisis in Gaza, the, the, the Israeli genocide in Gaza is now, it has mobilized, I think, awareness around the world and i think you know i've, I've kept meant, meaning to ask sean that incredible line do you remember it where he said it was it was the slogan of a south african sports association no normal do you remember that no normal sport in an abnormal society i may be missing the terms but something more or less like that we can ask him what it was exactly but that's i think that's where people i think people increasingly realize Israel is not a normal country and we can't have normal relations with it on any level, politically, academically, socially, musically, sports, like whatever. There needs to be, as we've said many times, uh, a system of boycotts in place. Of course, the, another question is, well, how? How does that happen? What do you think about the discussion of players, fans, fan organizations? You know, where, where, 
where do the structures come from in this case? What did you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I, I, I mean, I think this contrast between two, I think two contrasts. One is the contrast between the official institutional kind of setup at FIFA, at UEFA. FIFA, by the way, are, is the kind of the, the world organization of football and UEFA is the European version that, that have the, you know, that enforce and control the, the rules and the laws. And so the idea is this on the one hand, where at best they're silent, they're silent and silence any kind of dissent. And at worst, they kind of punish. They go through these punitive things of if you do anything, if you say anything, you get you get ejected. We didn't even get to the comparison with Russia and Ukraine very much, where, of course, the Russians get, get tossed out of a bunch of tournaments and football and tennis and others. Um, and, um, and, you know, perhaps they should, perhaps they shouldn't. But, the, you know, we, we get to the kind of double standards uh, in which in which Arabs in general and Palestinians in specific are always the exception to this, or the Israelis, I should say, are always the exceptions at this at this institution level. I think at the same time, uh, you know, the question of South Africa, where which had this Afri this kind of pan African solidarity among officially, whereas now Palestine Palestinians with a lot of Arab states that are effectively collaborating or colluding or uh, or at least being silent for for all sorts of you know pr practical reasons, uh, and, and we see this very very clearly. And and so you have this official Arab silence. You know, so of course they'll say things once in a while, that, you know, in terms of rhetoric, but they won't do anything. They they didn't even join the ICJ case. You know, South Africa led this, uh, which which is extraordinary. You know, you didn't have countries like Egypt and and other and other countries joining in on this. Uh, in the ICJ case. So what, what uh, I mean, the genocide case, because there's another ICJ case, as we know, going along at the same time. So, you know, so you have this. On the other hand, you've got this very much, as you're saying this, it's become very clear that, that this Gaza genocide has exposed the Israelis as not a normal thing. It's not a normal state. It's not a normal society. Uh, and, and this has been exposed, I think, globally. Now, how does one form? I think this is what Tony was focusing. How does one use this kind of global civil society awareness and the the extent of this Gaza genocide, the extent of this of this repression, of this uh, mean spiritedness with which they're filming themselves being mean spirited and being criminal, right? You know, and and cruel at the most base and basic kind of level. How do you transform that into a movement where there's so much repression, officially and unofficially, in the West, which is where this kind of stuff, for better or for worse, like this kind this stuff. Uh, tends tends to, to to resonate, you know, um, and that's that's the question. It's a question I think we need to, as we said, we need to have a, an episode maybe just focusing only on the BDS as a whole and bring in somebody to talk about this with us, and then from that talk about the football angle about how that works. I mean, I find it interesting that you know when you're looking around, you see, for example, even even Hollywood uh, and the musicians and kind of the big music, you see them circulating things. There's more. Of dissent, even though there's a crackdown, right? There's a, but there's, there's, there are things circulating. There are people taking stands at the Oscars, the people wearing their pins. You know, there, there is this kind of thing. Whereas in the football world, uh, as we said, aside from a few those of Arab descent, Arab or Arab descent playing in European leagues in the West, that who got tossed out, and nobody supported when, 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 when the guy was tossed out of Mainz in Germany, there weren't any German players that came in support. Nobody. It was like silence. The German reporters, German. The contrast is extraordinary. In France, same. Karim, by the way, it goes back. Do you remember when when Ozil had his falling out with Arsenal? Well, I mean, who knows exactly what went on? We will never know, maybe. But one of the things certainly was that he was he expressed support for the Uyghurs in China, and that got him in trouble with the Arsenal, right? So this long been this, you know. Or if we, again, just to keep Hamad it Arsenal, right? When Zinchenko Hamad said exactly when Zinchenko expressed his support for Ukraine and obviously also for Israel, yeah, that's fine. When Mohammed Landi says, "But what about Palestine?" Oh, Not what about no, he, he put he simply that. put so the flag. He I simply think, put the emoji. He put a flag. That's it. That's what he put. No, I know, but he was he, was, he chastised. was chastised for it. But right? interestingly, so, sorry to, yeah, to, to interrupt. It, but interestingly, Zinchenko yeah. had to you know he removed himself from all social media, not because he was officially reprimanded like Landi was, but because there was a backlash, yeah. a backlash uh, with people. So he had to kind of, he had to, he had to get out of social media. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it seems to me, if obviously we're not going to look to, I mean, I don't know, like legally, surely 
if they if there there must be some kind of mechanism. I mean, the level of rank racial discrimination within the Israeli sports league, and and obviously vis a vis their treatment of Palestinian sports institutions, the killing of all those players that you talk about, the destruction of stadiums, like all all that kind of stuff. There should surely be some form of recourse within the mechanisms of FIFA and UEFA to do something. We, we, I know, but we, of course, we all know FIFA and UEFA are going to drag their feet to the last second. They are like the equivalent. I mean, I think a little bit what we're seeing is the the big sports organizations, FIFA and UEFA in this case, or the Olympic Committee or whatever. These are the equivalent of governments as opposed to the people. The fans play the role of the people. So I think if we're going to have hope, I think it needs to be. It's going to have to be from the level of fans. That moment when Tony was saying that his football stadium is basically an ungovernable space, it's true. It is ungovernable. I, I can only hope that fans get on board and, and take action because then they will drag the clubs, you know, and that will drag UEFA and FIFA and so on. So there are there, there are forms of leverage that fans, like he, the point about the Super League, for example, which was stopped by the fans against corporate interest and the teams and everything else, right? Fans have power if they use it correctly. Now, the question is, will they or won't they? Yeah, I agree. And, and so to, just to end this, I think the, the, the thing of Palestine seems to be an exception for reasons that you and I know and everybody knows. It's an exception to all of this. Uh, and I think that's, that's important to kind of to remember. I mean, there's a huge amount. I mean, we saw even Celtic, the great Celtic fans, when they came out, as they seem to be doing on a regular basis, they came out you know, with the Palestinian flags and solidarity, and they were singing all these all these songs, they were, uh, they, were they were punished. So uh, it didn't stop them, but there is immediately a crackdown. Whereas in the case of Ukraine, uh, there wasn't, and and in other cases there wasn't. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very specific case, and I think it's true. I think what Tony was saying in particular, this this idea of, of trying to find, trying to make use of football as an ungovernable space to create a sense. Stadiums, the stadium, but, but football, I think in general, I mean, because if if you get players to join in and if it's not just one, like Muhammad Nani says something and they crack down, everybody shuts up. But if a bunch of people at the same time, prominent people, uh, you know, uh, Cantona and others join together as a as something and uh, uh, kind of create a certain thing, then you might also, you, there's you need to have this connection between the fans and the players that might be able to do something. And with that, I, I agree with Tony, there needs to be an organizing structure. Football fans may not, are not going to be the ones who are going to come up with an organizing structure. So where is that structure? It's through the BDS. And I think that needs to be the, the next thing that needs to be. And I know that BDS does it. I mean, I, I've seen several, and it's not that nothing's happening. There have been several initiatives over the years to try to take down the football business, at least football, may, maybe other sports, but I know football. Uh, and it kind of goes a little bit and then it, it, it disappears because it's, it's exceedingly difficult to get through these extremely powerful institutional setups where both at the international level, so FIFA and UEFA, and at the national level in France, in Holland, in England, and all these places, there's an, a swift and immediate, not just pushing away, but, but punishment that comes very quickly. And I think that's, that's important. I, I want to end on one positive note, if I can, which is very happy to report that yesterday the Israelis lost in the European Championships, the semifinal of the qualification. They lost 4-1 to Iceland. So thank you, Iceland, for that, uh, for ensuring that they didn't advance to the final and the possibility, and can you imagine, where the European Championships are taking place this summer in Germany. Could you imagine if the Israelis had somehow won, qualified for the European tournament and ended up playing in Germany? This would be, this is like the, a nightmare of nightmares. I think German law... I think I'm pretty sure German law would require all of the teams about to, to surrender, surrender and to and to, they, they would just they would just give it to the Israelis. Say Israel wins, and the rest of you have to go to work. That's it. We're not going to. No we games. can't. How can we? We must stand down. Stand down, everybody. Uh, the Israelis start with a plus ten goal difference and and hundred points, and and everybody has yeah. to catch up with them. So I just wanted to end with yeah. that positive note, uh, and and with this notion that yes, and Tony mentioned it that the Israelis in that match had to play in Budapest. And they already the Israeli press is already going on. Oh, that's one of the reasons they, they lost because they couldn't play at home, and, and so the punishment was to play. And you know, the punishment wasn't official, obviously, but they had to because of the war. They had to play in Budapest. So perhaps we can say that 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 thanks to the Palestinian resistance, the Israelis had to play in in a, in, in in Hungary, and they lost there. And if that's one little tiny little thing, then let, let's at least take that as a positive and. 
and, uh, and, and wish the Israeli team all the worst. Okay. And by the way, Palestine won at the same time, the same day, they beat Bangladesh. Thank you, Bangladesh. They beat Bangladesh 5-0. So they're now in second spot in the Asian uh, group, which also includes Lebanon, which lost to Australia, alas. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, at least Palestine won and they're doing okay in, that, in their group. So with that, thanks, Sari. And, Small and things. Osama had to Thank leave you. early, so he apologizes. So we'll catch you on the next episode. And uh, just a reminder to our subscribers to uh, give us five stars. That makes a big difference in the algorithms of all the all the podcast channels and so on. And follow us on Patreon, where we've just posted our first Q&A session, and there'll be other things going up there soon. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you.